very happy to be uh, among you. Uh, I believe the, this um, meeting today is uh, one of the most important meetings that has ever taken place uh, in human history. Uh, we are going to discuss in a systematic fashion the mother book of the Bobby dispensation, the Persian Bayan. And as far as I know, uh, such discussion um, has really never taken place. Uh, we are now uh, at a historical point that we celebrate the birthday of the Bab 200 years from now. And it is very important that the Bab would be celebrated by um, by getting to know his worldview, his words, his ideas. And uh, it is this aspect which would be the focus of event today. So for that reason, I consider this a great, great, great honor for me and a great, great, great privilege for me uh, to be uh, part of this this event. I want to thank uh, Spiritual Assembly of Santa Monica. They have always been very, very kind to me. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, not only providing the opportunity for discussion of various topics, but also recording them and uh, posting them uh, on their website so people who are not present here also can have access to those discussions. I'd like to thank uh, Spiritual Assembly of Los Angeles as well for publicizing this, uh, this event. Uh, we are going to have uh, four sessions today. Um, and we are going to, my, my aim is to look at the Persian Bayan in totality Uh, to understand the, the basic worldview of the Persian Bayan and at the same time the laws and commandments, ordinances uh, of that book. So, uh, so it would be a very complex discussion, but at the same time I want to look at the details of the Persian Bayan, so not just philosophical, theoretical discussion. Um, so I decided that uh, I would divide this uh, presentation into two parts. In the first part, I would discuss the philosophy and worldview of the Persian Bayan. And uh, probably the first two sessions would be devoted to this, but I have no way to predict how long it would take. Um, in the second part, we would look at uh, laws and ordinances of the Persian Bayon. Because I have never done something like that, I mean, I have discussed Persian Bayon, I have discussed frequently writings of the Bob, I have written a book long time ago called Gate of the Heart about the writings of the Bob. Um, but I have never done this so close so focus discussion of, of Persian Bayan with also emphasis on specific laws and ordinances and so on. So it was a challenge for myself what, what to do. So I used a sort of uh, sociological research method of content analysis. Namely, I read again, when I say again, this is at least tenth time, it's not again of the second time. Uh, Persian Bayan, and this time perhaps in the most uh, detailed, careful manner, more than any other readings that I had in my life. And so uh, for each chapter of the Persian Bayan, which Persian Bayan has 162 chapters, uh, for each one of them I uh, took particular notes, uh, noting the particular point or law of that. And then I, after I finished all these things, I went through them 
and I saw the commonalities and created categories that uh, all these 162 chapters would fall in them, and then looked at those categories and again looked at theoretically common element among those categories. Ultimately, that gave me four major categories. And those four major categories are the way that I would address the details of the Persian Bayan. Um, I created an outline yesterday, and the assembly, I didn't have ad access to printing at that moment, so the assembly was kind enough, one of the members of the assembly, I think, uh, who printed that. And so you have that. And if you look at that, uh, it first talks about the Bayan itself, namely the writings of the Bab, including the Persian Bayan, and the question of devotional acts, acts of worship, things like that. Um, so that would be the first major category. Things, the Bab in his Persian Bayan has a lot of ordinances related to, uh, to the Persian Bayan itself. I mean, to the writings of the Bab in general, but to the Persian Bayan itself. But they are also, of course, center of devotional acts, acts of worship, and so on. So um, temples and shrines and so on also would be part of that general category. And the uh, other category immediately becomes he whom God shall make manifest. The entire Persian Bayan is a love letter, really, to him, he whom God shall make manifest, namely the promised one that the Bob is constantly talking about him to come after him. If the entire Persian Bayan, you want to summarize it in one word, is he whom God shall make manifest. I mean, there is no one page of Persian Bayan that a systematic discussion of he whom God shall make, shall make manifest would not take place in it. There's no, no page, no chapter. Everything is he whom, he whom God shall make manifest. Uh, so the, uh, the aim and the meaning and the purpose of the first category, namely the question of Persian Bayan, acts of worship, all these things, the meaning and purpose of all of these is the second category, which is he whom God shall make manifest. Everything is related to him, but um, but there are some specific laws which are directly related to him. Everything is re related to him, but um, some of them conceptually. The Bob explains that if he has this law, it is for the sake of recognizing him, he whom God shall make manifest and the like. But then there are laws that are directly related to he whom God shall make manifest. So I put not the general, because the general becomes the entire Persian Bayan. Uh, I chose those parts which are directly legislation for the sake of and related to he whom God shall make manifest as part of this second category. And of course, the new culture of expectation, the new millenarian culture that the Bob is creating through Persian Bayon and his, his writings is all part of that second category. The third category are things related to human beings and the society. Um, and the, the vision that the Bob has of a new type of human being and and how hu human beings should be treated by human beings uh, and these are rooted in the first fundamental principle, uh, namely the question of Persian Bayan, acts of worship, and so on. And the one also additional element are regulations, legislation directly related to the Bobby king, to the kings and rulers. And uh, there are a number of uh, uh, chapters of the Persian Bayan, which directly legislate for this particular purpose. And this is, of course, continuation of the previous part, namely laws and legislations regarding human beings, and the kings become 
one category of these of these human beings. But those discussions have a particular uh, uniqueness of their own that we have to uh, discuss. So I haven't started my discussion. I just wanted to say what categories we are going to discuss. So in the first part, the basic worldview of the of the Bob of, of the Persian Bayan, we will discuss. In the second part, we are going to discuss the details of the Persian Bayan and its laws through those four categories. That's the plan for today. Let's start with the discussion of, uh, uh, well, let's discuss, uh, start with the sort of introduction, namely locating the Persian Bayan in the context of the writings of the Bab and ministry of, of the Bab. Uh, by the way, our plan is that I would talk for one hour and then there would be 15 minutes questions and answers and so on. So uh, when it is one, one hour past from my beginning of my talks, somebody should let me know. Um, the writings of the Bob and the mission of the Bob has different stages. Um, one of the stages that I, I'm not going to discuss at all in, uh, in this discussion, but it's very important, is that the Bob defines each year of his revelation, each year of his mission, as a fulfillment of one very important Islamic tradition. It's called tradition of truth or tradition of Kumail. Uh, Kumail was one of the disciples of Imam Ali, the first Imam of Shia Islam, and he once asked Imam Ali about truth, asked what is uh, truth. And uh, Imam Ali reluctantly, after some reluctance, started to define truth for him. And when he defined it, he, he couldn't understand, so he said, Zedni Bayanan, please explain more. So Ali repeats that in a different form, ex defines truth in another form. So this, te this takes place five times. There are five definitions of truth. After fifth time, again he says, I don't understand, explain more, that Ali says that uh, morning has dawned and it's time for prayer, and so he won't discuss it anymore. Uh, the Bab has a very important tablet, which is commentary or interpretation of this tradition, which I'm not going to discuss it at all. In Gate of the Heart, I have discussed it extensively. But in a number of his writings, including the Persian Bayan, the Persian Bayan, um, although it is written in the really third year of the revelation of the Bab, between the third and the beginning of the fourth, but the Bob refers to this and mentions that each one of, each one year of his revelation is a fulfillment and realization of one of those definitions of truth. And that those five definitions of truth are really uh, statements predicting the five years of his revelation. The reason that, you know, that the the Bible stayed with us in terms of number of years, that almost seven years. Um, the seventh year was not completed. The reason is that in terms of public expression of his religion, the Bob um, waited till the fifth year. And then it is in that fifth year that for the first time he unveils explicitly the truth of his revelation and the truth of his station. Prior to that, he conceals that and he speaks with wisdom. He speaks in ambiguous fashions about his station, whether he is a new prophet or he's just part of the Islam, whether he is the promised one that she Islam were waiting, or Sunnis also were waiting, Mahdi or Qa'im, uh, or he is a gate to that 12 Imam, or gate to that Mahdi. His 
Early writings and earlier pronouncements are ambiguous about these questions. It is on the fifth year that he makes it clearly public. So, um, so the first five years become very important. And of course, by the way, the fifth year is the time that Badash conference takes place. And in Tabriz, there is interrogation of the Bab. All of these are in the fifth year. And the consequence of that, of course, was that now that the clerics and states know that this is a much higher claim, it's not anymore just challenge of aspects of Islam, but it's, it's announcement of a new religion, completely uh, revolutionizing everything of the past, then the persecution and opposition takes new dimensions. And of course, the king of Iran dies shortly after that in the year five, and that creates another opportunity for the clerics. Uh, and the consequence is that the year five, because the truth becomes manifest publicly, uh, persecution takes new forms and it uh, leads to murder of uh, uh, of so many of the major figures of the Babi religion, uh, about nine members of the Letters of the Living, they die in Sheikh Tabarsi, Tabarsi upheaval, and that's part of uh, this year five. Anyway, I didn't want to discuss this, but <laughs> uh, this is just one example of different stages in the revelation of the Bab. But the most important stages that frequently it is discussed in his own writings as well, refers to um, not public expression of his claim, but his own expression within his own writings about his truth. And the turning point, so this would be two stages. The first stage when he's not very uh, explicit about his claim and the fact that a new religion has come, a new prophet, a new manifestation of God has come, that the age of Islam is over and a new age is beginning. Uh, so at first he was ambiguous about this, it's not clear. And so he does not legislate new laws. He just confirms Islamic laws. Uh, that is the first stage. And the second stage is when he begins uh, a new civilization. Uh, now, this takes place through Persian Bayan. Persian Bayan is the turning point uh, that the first stage ends and the second stage begins. The second stage begins with the writing of the Persian Bayan. Not Arabic Bayan, not, not seven proofs, not any other work with Persian Bayan. Uh, in the very first pages of Persian Bayan, he makes it very clear that the day he starts to write Persian Bayan, and he says that it is a Friday, that it is the first day that this new stage is beginning, and therefore a new resurrection, day of resurrection, is beginning. Uh, there is a lot of debate sometimes whether Persian Bayan is first written or Arabic Bayan is written and people have offered a number of arguments one way or another. Uh, when you read the beginning of Persian Bayan, it is categorical. Persian Bayan is revealed first, not only before the Arabic Bayan, but also before any other work of the Bab in which his, his new reality is explicitly Mentioned. So it's, it's absolutely the turning point. So in the very first pages of the Persian Bayan, he makes it clear that he is a new manifestation of God. He is a new prophet. He is the return of the truth of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he's also the Qa'im, the way Shia Islam uh, uh, perceived the promised one. Um, and uh, and that that day, Friday, is a day of resurrection, and uh, 
Islamic laws are being abrogated, new laws are being created, and so the very first pages, they are all, all these issues are being discussed. But then you might wonder uh, how uh, this happens in the third, between the third and fourth year. And I just talked about the year five being the year in which the truth of the Bab becomes completely manifest. Uh, the reason is that the Bab did not allow Persian Bayan uh, or works like that, which are very explicit about his station, to become publicized. Even a vast majority of the Babis were not familiar with this new book. It took a year that he allowed uh, these works to be uh, distributed among the Babis. And it, it is at that time that he's writing separate independent letters to the major figures of the Babi religion, telling them about his, uh, about his new claim. And for one of them, whose name is Azim, he writes a particular tablet uh, in which he mentions that he is the uh, promised one and gives this uh, duty to the address it as him to publicly announce this to the whole world. So it's not just among the Babis uh, either. The events that happen in Badasht um, and other events, uh, Badasht is in the summer um, of 1848, interrogation of the Bab is late summer of 1848, all of them are part of this new strategy of the Bab. And they are all organized by the Bab. It's very clear. It's not that Badash is usually a lot of scholars think that it was a few Babis decided together that let's define what Babi religion is. Is it a new religion or not? Uh, this uh, conception among a number of scholars not only is inaccurate, it's really a little bit offensive. Imagine that um, the prophet is in prison and the devoted ones to, of this prophet, when they have this major question, whether this is a new religion or not, instead of asking him uh, what is the situation, they say, oh, let's get together and decide whether it is or not. And this is the way usually it is expressed. And also historically it is inaccurate because as I mentioned, uh, just a few months before the Badash conference, the Bob is sending all these tablets, all these letters to major figures of the Bobby religion and we have these tablets. I have read so many of them. Most of them are not published anywhere. And they tells them about his, uh, his true station and so on. But in Persia and Bayan, all these things have been mentioned a year before. A year before these events, all these things have been written down by the Bab. But the Bab didn't think that people are ready yet. And for that reason, he postponed presenting this, this to the people. So Persia and Bayan becomes the turning point of these two stages of his revelation because people were not ready. In Persia and Bayan itself, twice the Bob talks about this same question. And he says that it was out of his mercy, out of his love, that because people were not ready, he reduced himself in presenting himself to the station of the gatehood of the 12 Imam, so that these people would have a chance that maybe they they would pay attention and gradually would be educated and so on. In two different parts of Persian Bayan, he discusses this issue. Um, you are familiar with his statement in Seven Proofs that he explains it, but also in Persian Bayan, he discusses that same question. In one of these places that he discusses this, he says that although out of his love and mercy for the people, he presented himself as a station who, which is so below his real uh, station, he says that anybody who had some insight, who was perceptive 
immediately could understand at that moment the truth of my revelation. And he says, the reason is that all my writings uh, who were presenting uh, uh, my claim were written in the form of divine verses. And he reminds us that according to Islam, only God can send divine verses. Divine verses are those things that God is directly speaking with majesty and so on. And that prophet also cannot bring divine verses. According to Islam, uh, Prophet Muhammad could not bring divine verses. That's why the words of Prophet Muhammad are different from the Quran. They are sacred words, whatever Prophet Muhammad would say, but they are not words of God. They are words of Muhammad. They are sacred. They have wisdom in, in them, but they are not words of God. Words of God is just one thing, and that's Quran. And they are all divine verses. And Quran always emphasizes that nobody, even if the whole world come together, they cannot bring a surah, a chapter like that. And it, many of the chapters of the Quran are just two lines, one and half line, the later ones. So the Bab says that even when he was presenting his session with wisdom, he was actually announcing in a very explicit fashion the truth of his session by making his writings take the form of divine verses. So it was very clear that uh, his session is above the session of prophethood. Namely, it is the truth of the prophet. The truth of prophet is different from the way that normally prophet is understood. And uh, we'll discuss that hopefully today. So before uh, we go uh, away from this introduction, I wanted to say that one of the most interesting aspects of this transition is that both stages are millenarian stages. Namely, both, both stages are filled with the issue of expectation of the coming of the promised one. But the first three years of his writings the millenarian expectation is the expectation of the coming of the 12 Imam, the Shia concept of 12 Imam, and the Sunni concept of Mahdi. Mahdi the Sunnis call that promised one Mahdi, the Shia Islam call it 12 Imam. Um, the Sunnis don't believe in any Imam, let alone the 12 Imam. Uh, but both of them are waiting for this promised one to come and present the truth of Islam and save it. So the early writings of the Bab speak as if uh, the Bab is uh, coming uh, uh, to present the ideas of this 12 Imam, of this Qa'in. Um, and the, the second stage of his writings are also millenarian, but it becomes 10 times more millenarian. Uh, because in the first stage, really, that promised one is himself. He's just speaking in an ambiguous fashion. But the, in the second stage, all his writings are talking about the coming of, of a new prophet of God, of a new manifestation. And usually he calls him varieties of this word, Man he whom God shall make manifest. Sometimes because, for instance, in Arabic Bayan, Arabic Bayan is all in the language of divine verses. So God is speaking directly. God sometimes addresses the Bab and says something or addresses others um, and, and says things. Um, for that reason, in Arabic Bayan, usually this he whom God shall make manifest is presented as as man knows heron nahu. Um, um, he whom we shall make manifest. Because God is speaking directly. So instead of saying he whom God shall make manifest, is he whom we shall make manifest. Uh, variations of this are frequent in, in his writing. And uh, many times he calls this 
same promise one, Baha'u'llah. So has two two names, two titles. One, he whom God shall make manifest and different expressions of that, and the other is Baha'u'llah. In Persian Bayan and in Arabic Bayan, frequently he mentions this, uh, and uh, hopefully we would discuss some of this when we look at the one that is very famous and you are already familiar with is when the, in the chapter that the Bob talks about the order of the bayan is very he has a lot of concerns about how the bayan should be preserved this book should be preserved and how his writing should be structured and published and printed and things like that uh, so the concept of nazme bayan the order of the bayan is very important for him. In the discussion of that, then he says, well, it is with person who um, recognizes the order of Baha'u'llah. Tu baleman yanzuru ila nazm Baha'u'llah. Well, it is with, uh, I don't remember the exact translation. Uh, him who uh, gazes at uh, or beholds or observes the order of Baha'u'llah. And of course, Baha'u'llah, in the, at the end of Kitab Aghdas, refers to this statement of the Bab and talks about this new order that he is uh, bringing. So that's one of the places that, um, that is very familiar. But there are a, a number of other places in Persian Bayan, Arabic Bayan, and so on that he defines this, he whom God shall make manifest as Baha'u'llah, glory of God. Okay, um, just one little point. Uh, the uh, Persian Bayan and Arabic Bayan uh, are uh, very similar. Uh, Arabic Bayan, of course, is in Arabic, and the only exception is that the first major chapter um, after it is discussed in Arabic, uh, the same idea briefly is also mentioned in Persian. This is in Arabic Bayan. But every other thing in Persian, in Arabic Bayan is just in Arabic. And they are very short, so it doesn't explain. It just gives the essence of everything. Persian Bayan, uh, is structured in a different form. Again, the very first chapter is different. Um, but in general, the way Persian Bayan is structured is that first, uh, in Arabic, the essence of that chapter is mentioned, which is very similar to the Arabic Bayan. It's not the same wording, but very similar, the same concept. After that, there is explanation and elaboration of that concept in Persian. And that can be half a page, can be 10 pages, uh, a number of chapters of the Persian Bayan are more than 10 pages. For instance, his discussion of marriage. Marriage it devotes a lot of pages to that, and a number of other um, other chapters. The reason that Persian Bayan becomes so important is that not only the basic fundamental principles of the new revelation, which also exists in Arabic Bayan, is presented in Persian Bayan, and Persian Bayan is the first which began revelation of this. But it becomes much more important because of those explanations that the Bob gives. And through those explanations, because there are so many different issues, Persian Bayan gives you a sort of encyclopedia, mystical encyclopedia of everything related to religion and spiritual principles. And for that reason, it is truly the most important work of the Bob and, and the mother book. And it is interesting that he decided to write it in Persian language, because most writings of the Bible are in Arabic. I'll say 95% of his writings are in Arabic. But the most important work, which becomes Persian, Bayan, has written it in Persian. 
Okay, um, the Persian Bayan um, has eight units. Each of these eight units have 19 chapters. The last unit, which is the ninth unit, um, has only 10 chapters. So he did not finish the ninth chapter. And he writes as if his writings should consist of 19 units, each one of them having 19 chapters. So together, it should be 361. For the Persian Bayan, he revealed only 162 of these chapters. And the 8 times 19 plus 10. 10 are the number of chapters of the ninth unit. Arabic Bayan, however, has revealed 11 units. And for that reason, it has 11 times 19 chapters. That means that eight units are still not revealed by the Bab in Arabic Bayan. And that becomes one of the puzzles of the Babi religion. Eight times 19 is 152. This number in Persian Bayan somehow becomes related to the station of Qudus. Exactly how and so on, it's a very complicated issue. I won't address it. But it is also interesting to know that Baha'u'llah, before he makes his claim very, very explicit, Namely, Baha'u'llah almost followed the same style that the Bab followed. So although in the Rezvan outside of Baghdad, he unveiled his, uh, his station, but he didn't call himself he whom God shall make manifest at that moment. The meaning was that, and anybody who listen, who pays attention to the words that he used, and we know what he said, because he has told us what he said on the first day of Rezwan. It is clear that that is the meaning, but he didn't use the word he whom God shall make manifest. It took a few years during the time of Istanbul and Adrianople, Aderne, that he gradually made this clear. The later parts of Aderne, then this is very clear. But earlier is not clear. For example, if you read Tablet of Ahmad, Tablet of Ahmad belongs to the early parts of Adrianople time. This is a time that Baha'u'llah is uh, addressing the Babis, telling them that the new revelation has come, which is himself. But at the same time, he doesn't use the word, he whom God shall make manifest. And at this time, he has not yet abrogated the, the laws of the Bab. That's why within Tablet of Ahmad, if you read it, he says that the Bab is the king of the messengers of God, and that his book is binding. The reason is that at that time, the writings of the Bab is not yet abrogated. The new, the new laws are not, has not yet come. Just like the first three years of the revelation of the Bab, that Quran was not yet abrogated. At the end even of Persian, of, of Tablet of Ahmad, uh, anyway, I should control myself not to go through too many things. Uh, we won't miss the basics. Huh, I wanted just to mention this, that in those times that Baha'u'llah is not yet very explicit about the fact that he is uh, the promised he whom God shall make manifest, he usually signs at the end of his tablets his name as 152. Example, tablet of Ahmad. I think in English, whenever this is translated, these parts would not be visible. Uh, but if you look at the original, uh, so many of the tablets of Baha'u'llah during these times, he signs at the end 152, which you have to read it as 251. 
and two is equal to the letter B, five is the equivalent to the letter H, and one is equal to the letter A. So it, it means Baha. So when you write the numbers, you go from left to the right, 152. But Arabic and Persian, when you write it, you write from the right to the left. So if you read it 251, it means Baha. But somehow this also has something to do with that eight units of the Arabic Bayan, which was never um, revealed. Um, in a sense, maybe this is one of the meanings of that, that the mere being of Baha'u'llah becomes fulfillment and realization of those remaining eight unities. It is not the case that the Bab forgot to finish these books. He did it intentionally. This is what he discusses in Arabic Bayan, that he intentionally decided that Persian Bayan would stop at that point, and that Arabic Bayan, he says that he would write it himself only by the end of 11th unit. And uh, he leaves the eight units to the will of God. Um, and that's a complicated question. Uh, we, we don't have time to discuss more this question. Okay, uh, now we want to start the discussion of philosophy and worldview of the Bible. The fact is that the Persian Bayan creates a revolution in culture, in theology, in philosophy, in everything. But the revolution is so fundamental that uh, it, uh, it is hardly noted by, uh, by people who love the Bab and who discuss the Bab, um, partly because the writings of the Bab have not been systematically studied, partly because it's revolutionary nature. It is so breaking, undermining all traditions, bringing completely new ideas. So if you just think in terms of traditional conception of religion and so on, you would miss the issues that he is discussing. Uh, so a few of these I would I would try to discuss them. Um, they have very modern, when I say modern, namely modern philosophical sociological sentiments. And that's one of the reasons that if you read Persian Bayan in a very traditional way, and the traditional way, if people read Persian Bayan, is to read and then talk about the meaning of this word or this statement is from Quran or is from a, a tradition. That's a traditional way of reading Persian Bayan, if it ever happens, because very rarely that even that happens. Um, if you read Persian Bayan or writings of Baha'u'llah and so on, in those ways, you are going to miss uh, almost everything. Um, so what we are going to discuss is uh, to focus on the ideas, on the concepts that Persian Bayan is bringing with itself. So I decided that I present this in terms of five categories, which I have mentioned in the outline. So I cannot elaborate because we have limited time today, uh, and they are very complicated concepts, So, and they are all related to each other. So we'll start, but together, collectively, focus on his word and, and his ideas, and hopefully it becomes clear. The first issue that I want to discuss is a general idea which is not only existing in Persian Bayan, but throughout the writings of the Bab. And that's a general concept of tajalli. Tajali is revelation, manifestation, unveiling, disclosing, emanation. Um, so when, for example, God would disclose himself, herself, itself to reality, um, shine upon reality, this is this revelation. 
this, this is unveiling. And first I talk about this concept of revelation, this manifestation in general. Then we look at, in the second part, um, how the Persian Bayan transforms this concept completely and offers a totally new way of looking at it, namely makes this concept of revelation a historical concept. The entire Persian Bayan is that, really. But before discussing that, and before appreciating this second part, we have to have some sense of this concept of revelation first. Now, um, the first point that I want to emphasize about this concept of revelation in the writings of, of, of the Bab is that for the Bab, all reality are interconnected, all reality are related to each other, and the truth of all reality is one and the same. This is the fundamental animating principle in the worldview of the Bab. Everything is sacred, everything is beautiful, everything is endowed with rights. Because in everything, ultimately, you would see one truth. There is one truth, the truth of everything is one and the same, and that's the revelation of God. That's a reflection of God in everything, which defines the truth of everything. This is the first elementary and at the same time the most important principle. In order to explain this, I decided to emphasize as a point of explanation two different uh, points, related points. One is a very famous Islamic tradition which says that all the spiritual truths which have been mentioned in all scriptures of God have been contained in the Quran. And then tradition continues. Everything which is contained in the Quran is contained in the first short introductory chapter of the Quran, Surah Fatih. And then everything which is contained in that introductory chapter of the Quran is contained in the opening phrase of the Quran, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, the most gracious, the most compassionate. And then it continues by saying that and everything which is present in the opening phrase of the Quran, Bismillah rahman rahim it is contained in the first letter of that phrase, which is the letter B. And the Imam ends his statement by saying, Letter B is Baha'u'llah. This is a very famous uh, tradition, and it has been uh, discuss in esoteric traditions, in Islam, in mystical, philosophical traditions frequently, and it has always been uh, a puzzle that what it means. The writings of the Bab, including Persian Bayan, which we would look at it soon, uh, addresses this. The immediate meaning of that becomes very clear, because Bismillah Rahman Rahim, that opening phrase of the Quran, consists of 19 letters. If you count the number of those letters, there are 19 letters. And from the point of view of the Bab, this refers to the Bab himself and the first 18 people who have recognized the Bab, who are called the letters of the living. So the letters of the living, the 18 letters of the living, together with the Bab, make 19. This is the primary unit of the Babi dispensation. From the point of view of the Bab, these 19 are return of all the sacred realities of all religions. In the case of Islam, this is very clear. From Shia point of view, in addition to God and, that, and the revelation of God, you have Prophet Muhammad, you have 12 Imams, you have Fatima, daughter of Prophet Muhammad, and then there are four gates who were mediating between people and the hidden imam, the 12 hidden imam. So they become 18. Together with God or some sort of revelation of God becomes 
the number become 19. Um, so, this becomes the immediate meaning of, of these traditions. But this immediate meaning is expressing a more deeper meaning. That more deeper meaning, which is discussed, almost e all early writings of the Bab are elaborations of this point. The point is this, that these 19 letters, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, they represent in a condensed fashion the truth of everything, right? The truth of everything is progressively contained in this. And the truth of this also is contained in the first letter, the letter B. The letter B, from the point of view of the Bab, is reference to the utter, pure revelation of God. And from the point of view of the Bab, the ultimate meaning of this tradition is that everything which exists, all reality are reflections and products and expressions of this utter, pure revelation of God. In everything, you have to see nothing but the pure reflection of God. Therefore, the truth of everything becomes one and the same. And that truth is divine revelation. Creation of a new culture in which when we look at anyone, anybody and anything, so this is both nature and culture, we have to see in them reflections of divine attributes. And therefore, we have to see everything and everyone as sacred, as beautiful, as endowed with rights. This is the fundamental principle of the new culture that Bob wants to create in the world. And of course, the beautiful progressive implications of this philosophical point of view um, is beyond description. The writings of Baha'u'llah, emphasis on issues like oneness of humankind, universal peace, and all the other principles that Baha'u'llah discusses, they are translations, realization, actualization, application of this philosophical principle, this metaphysical principle. And it is, in general, I should say that to know the writings of the Bab would enrich our understanding of the writings of Baha'u'llah tremendously. There is a rumor sometimes among some Baha'is that because the Babi religion is followed by Baha'i religion, therefore we don't need to read the writings of the Bab. Even people try to make a virtue out of this ignorance by saying that the Bab himself says that if you read one verse of he whom God shall make manifest is better than reading the entire Bayan. The Bab says that. But what he means is an entirely different concept. It's a concept of progressive revelation. Namely, if you read the entire Bayan, but you do not recognize he whom God shall make manifest, manifest when he appears, because the entire meaning of all these writings is for the sake of recognizing he whom God shall make manifest, then that reading had been a useless reading. Namely, you have understood nothing. You have just uh, mentioned in a unconscious fashion some words. Uh, versus a situation that he whom God shall make manifest has appeared and now you have recognized him and you are reciting one of his words with recognition and belief that from the point of view of the Bob, this is superior than reading all the Bayan without understanding the meaning of that, and recognizing he whom God shall make manifest. This is what he is discussing, which is a universal principle. Not that just one verse is better than thing like that. That is, that is not the point. The second the related point is about the concept of interpretation. Concept of in more technical academic language concept of hermeneutics. Namely, how we read a text and how we interpret the text. 
A lot of early writings of the Bab are in the form of interpretations or commentaries on some chapters of the Quran. You are familiar with that. His beginning announcement was through writing a commentary on the Surah of Joseph, one of the Quranic Surahs, and many other Surahs of Quran has been interpreted by the Bab. The most important question about these types of works of the Bab is to discover and understand the logic of interpretation in the writings of the Bab. This most important question has been usually completely ignored. I mean, again, because of lack of familiarity with the writings of the Bab. Uh, before knowing how he interprets this chapter of the Quran, how he, he interprets that chapter of the Quran and so on. You have to understand the principles of his interpretation. I share with you the most important principle that he discusses. For the Bab, the sacred word, including Quran, because it is the word of God, therefore it is creative. That becomes the most important feature of the Bayan as well. Because it is creative, the word at all different levels, thank you, of existence, it brings into existence new reality. It just is not that describes reality, but brings into existence a new civilization. At all levels of reality, it brings a new reality. And therefore, these are the meanings of the sacred word, a word which is creative. And so according to the Bab, sacred words have infinite meanings. It doesn't have one meaning. It doesn't have two meanings. It doesn't have three meanings. It, ha it has infinite meanings. Having said that, despite the fact that the sacred word has infinite meaning, there is one level of divine word which is superior than all other levels of meaning. One meaning, one interpretation is the privileged one, is the supreme interpretation. What is this one meaning and what is this one method of reading sacred texts in order to understand that privileged meaning? He discusses this in a number of places in his first work, which is even before his declaration, in commentary on the Surah of Kao, Surah Baghari. He discusses that in parts of that. In his uh, commentary on the Surah of Kausar, he discusses that a number of times. It's, it's a general principle that he refers, but it's so complex that you, you have to pay very much conceptual attention to, to see what he's saying. His basic point is that in order to understand this supreme meaning of the word of God, it is important that when you are reading the sacred word, you do not pay attention to the differences of letters, to the differences of the words, differences of sentences, differences of paragraphs, differences of chapters, and the like. This is the exact opposite method that we normally have of interpretation. When we want to interpret or understand a statement, we look at exactly what words are used, what sentences are used, look at particular situation that this sentence was written, and through that we try to understand what it means. The Bible says ignore overlook completely the differences between the letters, words, sentences, chapters, and the like, if you want to understand the supreme highest meaning of the sacred word. But then how is this possible? Well, he explains for us. The highest supreme level of meaning is realized when you look at the holy text as one absolute unity. And this absolute unity is nothing but divine revelation, pure divine revelation, which is animating itself and appearing in different form. But the truth of all these different words, all these different letters, all different sentences, the truth of that is that utter pure divine revelation. That is the ultimate meaning of the sacred word. That is the ultimate truth of the sacred word. And by the way, this utter pure revelation is the truth of everything. 
The sacred word is defining, unveiling the truth of everything. But the truth of everything becomes what? Becomes that pure revelation. The fact that everything is reflection of God, reflection of divine attributes. And the highest meaning, it's one of the meaning, but it is the most important meaning of the sacred word is the fact that it is nothing but reflection of the unity, absolute unity, purity of divine revelation, which in at that level there is no differentiation, there is no diversity, there is no plurality. Things are not opposed to each other. All are one and the same. That absolute pure unity is the truth of all these different chapters and sentences and so on. The Bible says that you can understand this level of meaning if you come from a particular perspective. If you come from perspective of the heart, which you'll see heart becomes the highest spiritual station of reality for the Bob. And that you are in the kingdom of absolute divine kingdom. So you are not living in the phenomenal realm, in a, in a material realm. Um, if from that point of view, in that realm, you approach the divine text, then you see the whole text as one absolute unity. And that's the supreme meaning uh, of, of the divine text. Now, an implication of this is very interesting. It means that because for the Bob all sacred works, sacred books are one and the same, then the highest spiritual, the highest understanding of the word of God requires ignoring the differences between Quran, the Bayan, Torah, Gospel, Avesta, and all other sacred books. And when you are reading, in order to understand anything in the Quran, anything in the Gospel, the highest meaning requires that you don't see Quran as separate from Torah, from Gospel, from other things, that you see all of them as one and all of them as this pure revelation of God, reflection of God. When we come to a point that we say oh, Quran says this, but Gospel says this, and they are different and so on, then we, are, we have descended from that supreme level. We are in the lower stages, and they have their own levels of meanings, but all those meanings should be in the context of this supreme interpretation. And you see, for me, when I was reading these writings of the Bab and understanding this principle of hermeneutics uh, of the Bab, that was sufficient for me to, to recognize the extraordinary reality of this young man. He was very young, the Bab. He was extremely young. I mean, this level of creativity is absolutely unmatched, unprecedented, these, these discussions and this, uh, this principle of hermeneutics and so on. What it means is that all sacred words, the real meaning of every sacred words, even if you read the Quran and and there would be a sentence that apparently is talking about the necessity of some sort of jihad. From the point of view of the Bab, to understand the truth of every aspect of the Quran, every aspect of gospel, every aspect of the Bayan, every aspect of Aqdas, every aspect of, of uh, Avesta or any other sacred works, is to understand the unity of all these texts, and the fact that this unity is the truth of everything. And that therefore the ultimate meaning, the ultimate message of every sacred work, every letter in any sacred work is one and the same. That's the sanctity, the beauty, the sacredness of all beings. That is the truth of Quran. That's the truth of Bayan. That's truth of Torah and so on. In the lower levels of understanding then, other differences emerge and so on. And they become related to particular times and so on. But the ultimate truth of these spiritual texts are, is this. 
Now put together these two examples that I mentioned in the writings of the Bab. The supreme interpretation, method of interpretation of the writings of the Bab, as well as fulfillment of, of the fact that all truth is contained in the letter B of the opening phrase of the Quran, which in the Persian bayan, the opening phrase of the Quran, takes a new form. It becomes Bismillah al Amna al Aqdas, in the name of God, the most inaccessible, the most holy. Uh, the emphasis now is the fact that we cannot know God, we cannot describe God. In the Quranic expression of that, God is being described. God is compassionate, God is merciful. But here, the emphasis is that God is beyond description. The, the most holy or the most sanctified, Aqdas, uh, uh, that it can be described. And his Amna, namely, is higher uh, than the possibility of being described or known or recognized or praised. But Bismillah al-Amna al-Aqdas also consists of 19 words, 19 letters. Just like the opening phrase of the Quran, it consists of four words. Remember these four words because we are going to talk about it. Everything becomes almost four stages or, and four things, and everything becomes related to each other, and all of them become reflections of these four letters of the opening phrase of the Quran, which becomes the four categories of divine hierarchy reflected in the Bab and the letters of the living as well. Okay, um, we are, I am going to uh, stop at this uh, moment. Uh, as usual, I'm always behind. I, uh, but I, uh, I don't want this particular session that we have would be one that in the middle of it, uh, we would stop. That's normally the way I conduct because I always underestimate the time that I need. And so, but it is very important honoring uh, birthday of the Bob that I would discuss some basics of, of all different parts. So, um, in my uh, uh, other uh, talks, I try to be a little more concise, more controlled and restrained, and so to be um, dealing with all these uh, issues in a timely fashion. Uh, right now, if there are uh, questions, this is a good time to uh, discuss them. Yes. Uh, and the condition under which, thank you, uh, the condition under which he was able to either write himself or dictate uh, these portions of Persian Bayan, and how long did it take for him uh, to complete to the point that he said that was all he was going to write? A very good question and a complicated question. The first part is easy. Namely, definitely it is uh, while he is in Maku. The Persian Bayan constantly refers to the fact that he is in the mountain of Maku. That's one of his favorite points. He wants to show and refer to the ignorance of the people who claim allegiance to the Quran and to Islam and Prophet Muhammad. And uh, so he always says that um, these uh, uh, people, uh, because of their love for uh, 
Islam, for Prophet Muhammad, for Quran, for the words of God, and so on, their highest uh, honor is that they somehow relate themselves and have the honor of attribution to, to the word that he uses is tin, uh, namely dust. Uh, in other words, spending, as the Bob says, so much money in order to go and visit the shrine of one of the imams for the Shia Islam. Or, at the most, uh, spending so much money and going to Mecca for the, uh, for the pilgrimage. But that means, again, going and revolving around a piece of uh, dust, a piece of clay and, and dust and so on. And he mentions this a number of times, and says that um, in varieties of, of, of ways that this is descent from the holy, namely this dust that becomes so holy for these people that they are, their honor is that they would be somehow related, associated with the dust. Uh, is that somehow this dust becomes related to an imam, for example. But the imam becomes imam and important because it was mentioned by the word of Prophet Muhammad. He always says that if Prophet Muhammad has not mentioned the word imam, no imam would ever be created. Namely, imams, although they are sacred people, but they are nothing at the level of Prophet Muhammad. And he says that Prophet Muhammad becomes prophet and becomes sacred and his words become important because the words of God, namely Quran, is revealed to him. Otherwise, he wouldn't be important. He becomes important because he receives the words of God. And then he says that the one who is revealing these words of God right now has come back, which is the truth of Prophet Muhammad has come back and is speaking those same words. And yet these people who by hierarchy of descent, of association, they are worshiping dust because of their allegiance to the word of God. Now that the same word of God in a more mighty fashion has appeared out of divine mercy among them and is calling them, not only they ignore him, but they persecute him and his followers so much. And they go, they spend so much money and energy and so on to go to the shrine of this person and that person. And the Bab himself, who is the Prophet Muhammad himself, the truth of Prophet Muhammad, who has come, they have put him here in this mountain. And they have deprived him even of having one lamp, one light. Uh, and he says that in their, in their shrines of these people who indirectly and indirectly and indirectly becomes, they become sacred because they are associated in so many indirect hierarchical fashion to him, namely to the Bab, then they have, of course, all these lights and so on. That's why he says the, the Bab that with regard to sacred shrines and so on, he says that, um, there is no limit for, light um, and uh, that that was because there was no light uh, in uh, in Maku so the reference to the idea that he is in the mountains of Maku is constantly present all over Persian Bayan there are indications also that when exactly it's starting um, it's if I remember, and I'm not 100% right now sure, close to the third unity, so it is earlier parts, but not right the beginning, the Bab talks of that time as being very close to three years from his revelation. Um, so these, and together with, with other evidences and so on, uh, give us a very good idea that when it was, it is early times in Maku uh, that the Persian Bayan begins to be revealed. Um, when it was finished, that's a question. And uh, 
and better I won't uh, start it because it becomes a very, um, but uh, in Gate of the Heart, I mentioned the possibility that maybe the, the last part of Persian Bayan is written during the Chehrik. But I mentioned this as a possibility. Uh, and now I, I am more inclined to believe that no, everything had been in, in Maku. Uh, and, uh, and he intentionally, as he explains that in Persian, in Arabic Bayan, he explains that he intentionally left Persian Bayan this much. He had no intention of finishing it. It was not forgetting or not having time. Uh, and the same thing with Arabic Bayan. For Arabic Bayan, there is very, very, very clear reason that he had only 11 unities. But to discuss that reason, we require two sessions, just that I, I would discuss that. Yes. My mind is smaller than this, you know, but I was always wondering, um, thank you. Um, I was wondering about, you mentioned that at Badasht, the Bab was controlling everything and it wasn't like these people went off and did this by themselves. And I was wondering, it often mentions the greatest name and how Hussein Ali, you know, the Baha'u'llah, how did he get the name Baha? Did he choose the name Baha and the Bab ratified it or did the Bab give him that name and how did that name Baha become so significant when I don't know if people would really realize that how important it was. Very good question. <laughs> In Don Breakers it mentions that it was during the Badash conference that Baha'u'llah gave these different titles to different people, including Tahereh. I believe this is not completely accurate. And the Dunbergers is the best ultimate uh, um, original uh, history document of the Babi religion. And therefore, there is no work in terms of historical research more important than Dunbergers. But it doesn't mean that everything which is in Don Breakers is correct. I mean, the early stages of the Babi religion is a very confusing time, and people don't have access to much of the writings of the Bab. People are being killed. People are being persecuted. It's a very exciting a spiritual time, so the minds of the people are between this world and the celestial realm, and memories, uh, because of their devotion, plays tricks on them and different people have different accounts and so for that reason um, uh, there are always in description of events and so on uh, not only in down breakers but in every other description of uh, original descriptions of the time there are so many mistakes uh, down breakers is one of the most accurate ones um, the work which is famous as noqtatul kaf which became a matter of a lot of debate and so on, is filled with so much inaccuracies. The author of Nuqtatul Kaf mentions that the Bab stayed in Maku for three years. And if you know anything about the history of the Bab, you know that a person who says something like that, it means that he has no idea about the history of the Bab. Three years in Maku. I mean, it destroys and and distorts everything about history and so that, and he didn't know, of course, anything about the writings of the Bab. That's why he makes all these philosophical speculations on the basis of Islamic, Sufi concepts and so on, and he thinks that he is presenting Babi idea. The earliest Babis didn't know much, except, you know, people like Mullah Hussein, Qudus, Tahere, and so on, they are exceptions. In any case, so, uh, Don Breakers is ultimately what uh, Nabil has heard from different people and so on. And these accounts, uh, a number of them have some problem. Overall, it is the most accurate, uh, very important work that we have. But I believe that that story is not completely correct. For example, um, 
according to Don Breakers, it is at Badash that Tahere is given the title Tahere by Baha'u'llah. We know that this is absolutely not true. At least a year before that, the Bab in so many of his tablets has defined Tahere as Tahere and gives gives her the, this uh, title. Uh, so what also it was the habit of the Bab that usually defines and gives titles and names to his followers, uh, usually as one of the names of God. And this partly you can understand. Of course, I have to explain more. But for the Bab, the truth of everything is divine revelation. So he's talking about the truth of beings. And the truth of being is that all are reflections of God. That's why Qudus becomes Qudus. Qudus is one of the names of God, one of the very important names of God in Islam. Um, Azim, his name is Sheikh Ali Torshizi. He becomes Azim. Azim is one of the names of God that Quran so many times is mentioned. It means Almighty or something like that. Quran constantly talks about Ali and Azima. Ali, who is Azim. The word Ali, which is in the name of the Bab, is Ali Muhammad. Ali is the name of God. Ali means the exalted, the supremely exalted. And Quran defines God, among other things, frequently as Ali and Azima. So the name of the Bab, which is Ali Muhammad, Ali also refers to the name of the first Imam of Shia Islam, but the main meaning of that is not that. The main meaning is that it becomes symbol of God, is Ali Muhammad. And the second one, Muhammad, becomes symbol of prophethood. And this becomes the truth of the point, which hopefully I would discuss, namely from the point of view of Persian Bayan, the point, namely the truth of prophets, have two stations, divinity and servitude. Divinity is the station of being a prophet. Uh, uh, servitude is the station of being prophet. Divinity is the station of being a mirror in which nothing can be seen except God. It's not the God, it's not the sun in heaven, but it's reflection of that in the mirror of the truth of the, of the prophet. And the truth of the prophet is that divinity of the prophet. But in a sense, Everything is that same thing. Everything is both servant of God and at the same time is reflection of God. So we have also, everything has divinity and servitude. And because the purpose of the Bab was to create this culture that people would see the truth of things, the truth of the people, namely they see the unity of everything and everyone, to see the beauty of everything and everyone, to see God in everything and everyone, in order to convey this message and to train the Babis, one of the things that he did is that frequently for different Babis, when he would give them titles, he would give the title of one of the names of, names of God. It doesn't mean that this particular person, because this title is given to them, is unique or different. Uh, it's expression of the fact that they are all reflections of God and the fact that they become important because they are a mirror who are reflecting the truth of divine. But if they turn away from that divine truth, by themselves they become absolutely nothing. So calling a person by the names of God or calling and saying that in a number of his tablets, the Bab has done this to a person. He writes that there is none other God but me. And then there is, he says, addressing that person, there is none other God but, but you, but, but thee. Um, and this doesn't mean that this person and the Bab are one and the same or have the same station. This means that everyone has to see in everything and themselves Nothing but revelation of God. It is God who is the agent, who has the power, who has reality in everything. Everything by itself, separate from God and turning away from God is absolutely nothing. 
So it's a statement about the fact that everything is nothing and at the same time that everything is beautiful, is sacred. This combination, this paradox is the mystery of the writings of the Bible and he practices that all the time. With regard, so I believe that these are the titles that the Bob in his writings have been assigning people, uh, and in Badash, Baha'u'llah standardizes this uh, for, for the people. Uh, and the, the title Baha remains a mystery. We know that Baha was called by all the Bob, Baha'u'llah was called Baha. This was the way he was always, even by his enemies, within the Babi community, he's uh, referred always as Baha or Janabe Baha or thing like that. Um, but uh, the origin of that has to be the Bab. But somehow the Bab wanted this, this praise of Baha'u'llah to remain some sort of secret. And just one expression of that is the fact that the community uh, was uh, allowed to define him as Baha. But the tablet in which the Bab does so is not available. It was sort of agreement between the Bab and Baha'u'llah that focus on Baha'u'llah and the station of Baha'u'llah remains a mystery. So some other Babi, prominent Babis, the Bab would go on the contrary, to make them very explicit. Um, but Baha'u'llah remained a mystery. But he, he talks in his writings about this, what he, he, he refers to him as Hussein ibn Ali, Hussein the son of Ali, that he would be the ultimate leader, but he says that he would be unknown. And he encourages his followers, this is uh, in the last year of his life, to go all over and try to find and identify him. Baha'u'llah decided never to identify himself, that he is that person. And, uh, and it is only that later he identifies himself as he whom God shall make manifest. But as the leader of the Babi community, that he really was, according to the words of the Bab, he was this mystery behind invisible, and he never decided to make this invisible reality a visible one. There was one question, and that would be the last question for now. We would have plenty of opportunities for questions later. Uh, hi, thanks for uh, teaching us the basics. Well, to you might seem like the basics, but to us, like, whoa. <laughs> So I'd like to bring up a question because at, when I was reading about the conference of Badasht, I saw that there was basically two factions of believers, the more uh, moderate ones led by Qudus, who uh, basically wanted to continue within the Islamic tradition, or so I was reading, and then a liberal tradition led by Tahare, which it's like, oh, we need a complete break from the laws and traditions of uh, Islam. And basically, like, the Bab was basically, like, we need a new system of laws, a new system for everything, including the equality of all women. And we all know which side won during that conference, the side of Tahere. But, and then... I guess what confused me was um, at this conference they were debating what is the exact nature of the Bob's revelation. So when you mentioned that the Bob was initially ambiguous about or he didn't reveal the full truth of his station, like you said, oh, I am the Qaim, the t return of the 12th Imam, but he never said, oh, I'm a prophet. I, what I say is basically a complete break with the tradition of Islam. And that, that second stage, of course, didn't happen until around the time of Badasht. Yes. So did any of the letters of the living besides Baha'u'llah, well, any, any of the Bob's followers besides Baha'u'llah, like Mullah Hussein or 
Tahere or like did they have like an understanding that he was a complete break given they were close to the Bob but sure yeah um, actually in my discussion I mentioned this very briefly so I'll be a little bit more explicit um, but uh, Barash is a very you know famous topic for discussions and as I mentioned scholars who have talked about this have uh, said different things and basically what you mentioned is the idea namely the uh, followers of the Bob, some of the major followers of the Bob said that let's get together and decide what is Bobby religion, what is the station of the Bob. And then there are two groups and they contain and then the, the, the radical uh, segment led by Tahereh would win. Uh, this is completely incorrect, this whole discussion. And the reason is, um, one of the major reasons is lack of familiarity with the writings of the Bab. Scholars who have written history of the writings of the, of, of the Bab uh, rarely have read really much of the writings of the Bab. And their access also has been very limited to writings of the Bab. So a lot of these uh, things are uh, speculations uh, not based upon knowing really in terms of what the Bab was communicating. As I mentioned, a year before Badash conference, Persian Bayan and so many other works of the Bab are revealed in which the Bab is absolutely clear about his station. By the way, the Bab in the first three years, he never said that he's the Qa'im. If he had said that, it would have been explicit. He always talks as if he is the gate to the Qa'im, not the Qa'im himself. It is in the fifth year that he says that he's the Qa'im at the same time, the Qa'im is not what the Shia Islam or Sunni Islam thought, that he is a new prophet. And these are all simultaneous. It's not that first he says Qa'im, and then he says he's a new prophet. All of them at the same time. Um, but if you, not only the Bab, a year before Badasht, has written all these various works in which he is absolutely explicit about his claim. He abrogates Islam, brings all these new laws. In addition to that, about two, three months before Badash, the Bab decided that this is the time to make it clear to the Babi leaders about his truth and his real station. So at this time, he's writing all these letters to major Babi leaders, telling them about the fact that he's a prophet of God, that the age of Islam is over, that this is the day of resurrection, including, you know, that he is Qa'im. To be Qa'im is one of the lowest ways that he would describe himself. Um, and for that, now this fact that the Bab has revealed all these tablets to the Bab is, the scholars who write history, they, they don't know. They don't know about these tablets. They never studied them. They, they are not really much publicly available, and so they, they don't know. Um, Badasht happens, and immediately after that, the Bab himself in the interrogation in Tabriz makes it clear what is his station. Badasht happens because the Bab has, before Badasht, told the major Babi leaders of his truth and his true claims. Um, and for that reason, Badash is created because the Babi leaders knew. And so they wanted somehow to educate the other Babis, but they knew that the Babis also are not yet all of them ready. So they had to stage this show in order to present it. And so Tahereh versus Godus, these two most important figures of the Babi religion, have to pretend that they have disagreements, and then through arguments and so on, Odus himself comes to the point of view of Tahere, and this way others also follow and so on. So it was all a stage. But aside from all these things, as I mentioned, it's an offensive statement, this, is, this type of historiography. Imagine, for example, Baha'u'llah is present right now. Baha'u'llah is in prison. Now, a number of us Baha'is are not sure, is he a new prophet or is just a sacred person within Islam? 
And for this very important question, and then to decide what to do now, should we now um, stop acting on the basis of the Islamic law, previous laws or not, that we come together and say, forget Bob, Bob Bahala, Bahala is not important. We just ourselves decide. Doesn't make sense. Unless these people had no belief in the Bab whatsoever. If they have a belief in the Bab, if Qudus is not sure about what is the real station of the Bab, it's so easy. And there is only one way, there can be second way. The only way is to ask the Bab, what is your claim? Are you a new prophet or not? And as I mentioned, two, three months before this event, the Bob has sent them letters, told them about his station. That's why all these events are taking place. The historiography about the Badash conference has to be rewritten completely. Shoghi Effendi, together with Nikolai, um, who had a lot of emotional sympathy with the Babi religion, with the Bob, um, both of them noted and have mentioned that the disagreement between Qudus Tahereh was a show. It was a staged performance. And that's the only thing which fits uh, all various forms of facts. So but that should be redefined. Um, <clears throat> so let's have a break for 